A very good morning to you all. And happy Easter. Uh, it's nice to be back in Swan Lien to preach this morning on this special day and also a day in which we celebrate the risen Christ. Let us join our hearts together. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The title of this morning's sermon, I entitled it Mary Easter Symphony. Actually, it should be Mary Magdalene's Easter Symphony because sometimes we're mistaken the Mary, because there's also Mary in the Gospel of Luke, which is the mother of Jesus, but there is also Mary Magdalene, which is not the mother, who is not the mother of Jesus, but Mary who comes from the town called Magdala. And so that's why we, we associate Mary Magdalene as someone who comes from the town called Magdala, Mary Magdalene. So I want to make some corrections to the title of this sermon and call it Mary's Magdalene Easter Symphony because in the Gospel of Luke we have also Mary's song which is a very different one that is the song that is sung by the mother of Jesus at the birth of Christ so this morning we will look at Mary Magdalene Easter Symphony in which you could read from, from John's passage chapter 20 verse 1 to 18, which I want to focus on verses 11 onwards. But when we think of movements, we think of physical movements such as bending forward to touch our toes or swinging sideways. Or when we think of movements, we think of movements of the dance, of dancers dancing from one end to another end and so forth. But there are also movements in music too. You know. A movement of, is one of the main parts of a piece of music, such as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Symphony has four movements. I'm not a musician, but I learn and I check what are these four movements of a symphony. Apparent, apparently, there is a standard pattern. The first movement is brisk and lively. For those who are musicians will know what it means. Ram, brisk and lively. The second is slower and more lyrical. The third is an energetic minuet. This means maybe a short one, a rather boisterous one. And the fourth is a carefree and rowdy finale. Well, I was checking, I was doing some research on this symphony. I began to realize that I can use this symphony, these four movements, with Mary's Magdalene encounter with Jesus Christ in chapter 20, verse 1 to 8 in Gospel of John. It is a symphony of four movements. Perhaps it will not be the same type of the four movements of the traditional classical music movement, but there are four movements. The first movement is what we call weeping. The conductor of the orchestra begins with a symphony with some light notes, maybe, bringing us to listen to the footsteps of Mary Magdalene walking in the darkness of the morning. Upon reaching the tomb, we hear the drums of the orchestra, resounding loud with boom, boom, boom. Why? Because Mary found that the stone has been rolled away. Where's the Lord's body? Maybe that the drums will start boom, or the, the clanging of the cymbals. Imagine that the violinist begins to pluck the strings of their violins with quick and short notes. Where is the Lord's body? Where is the Lord's body? And then the symphony moves to moving to Mary, to Mary standing outside the tomb, weeping, weeping. 
So remember, this is a symphony about Mary's Magdalene. So I have missed the part of Peter and the beloved disciple, which will come later. But this is a symphony that is attributed or composed in the light of Mary's Magdalene. So Mary Magdalene was overwhelmed with the loss of Jesus' body. So there was an exchange. Imagine there was an exchange of all the different musical instruments in the orchestra. She was so focused on the loss of the body of Jesus that she obviously did not even show any surprise when she was even addressed by the two angels. Seeking Jesus, looking for Jesus is a good and positive thing. But the grief of Mary has so overwhelmed and so blinded her that she was not able to recognize Jesus when Jesus was revealing to her. Imagine that the music of the symphony becomes somewhat slow and sad because of Mary's response, her inability to recognize this Jesus who was standing before her. Thinking that he was the gardener, she responded, she repeated her response, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus responded by asking this question, Whom do you seek? Jesus did not say, What do you seek? And so this reminds us Jesus' first words to the disciples of John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus told the disciples who were following him, What are you looking for? And here Jesus is asking the question to Mary, not what are you looking for, but whom? Who are you looking for? Jesus challenged her weeping, trying to refocus Mary's upset attention, Mary's focus on the physical body to this person who is standing behind in front of her. Mary was fixed and obsessed with a missing body, a physical body. The focus to what rather than to who. So Jesus asked, who are you looking for? Jesus did not ask, what are you looking for? And so the slow and comforting rhythm of the movement could be heard in the words of Jesus to Mary Magdalene, who are you looking for? Who are you seeking? It is an invitation to Mary, an invitation to Mary to surrender her obsession with the physical presence of the earthly Jesus. And Jesus is preparing her to cross to cross over to understand a new perspective of who this Christ is. Who this Jesus is. This Jesus is not that physical, earthly Jesus whom you have heard, whom you have been, but this earthly Jesus is the resurrected one. Is also the resurrected one. What are you looking for has been turned into a question of who is looking for. This who is looking for is a question of a new start. It is a new beginning. It is a new story. It is a new store. It is a new ministry that is beginning for Mary and the rest of the disciples. This reminds me when we go shopping at Watson or Poya or one of the shopping centre. When you're looking for something, you know, and some, some of the helper, the attendant will come and look and ask you, what are you looking for? You say, what are you looking for? Can I help you? 
maybe I can help you. And then it's like, what are you looking for? But Jesus did not say, Walking, what are you looking for? Jesus said, who are you looking for? And so at this Easter morning, Jesus is asking the same question to us, individually. And also corporately as a church. What are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Who are you looking for in our lives? Are our tears, like Mary's weeping, blinded us? Blinded us so much that we are not able to recognize Jesus, the resurrected one who is in our midst, but still looking for the body of Jesus who is no longer in the tomb. Mary was looking for the body of Jesus, but Jesus did direct her from a body to his physical presence in the presence of Mary. So this is the first movement. And just imagine that the first movement of this symphony gently moves to the second movement with equal gentleness and comfort. The second movement, I entitle it as Turning. Mary. At the address of her name, Mary. Mary turned. Mary turned and Mary called him Rabboni, which was translated to mean teacher. Just one word, Rabboni. Just one word. Mary. And I could imagine at this point of the symphony, the brass, the instruments of the, of the, sim, of the orchestra would play a short beat. Ba, 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 ba. Wow, such a resounding, maybe short ones. Mary, Jesus called her name. Ramboni, Mary Magdalene responds. When Jesus called Mary's name, it reminds us of a teaching, a long teaching that Jesus did, what we call the shepherd discourse. He's talking about, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, Jesus continued to say, I am the good shepherd. Who is this good shepherd? He said, this shepherd knows his or her sheep by name and leads them out. And the sheep will hear his or her voice and follow him, follow this shepherd. And so here we see Jesus know his own. Jesus knows his own as much as the Father knows him and he knows the Father. In John 10 verse 14 to verse 15, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own knows me. As the Father knows me, I know the Father. Jesus calls his sheep by name and they know his voice and follow him. And certainly, the sheep does. Because Mary's response is, Rabboni. Mary did not hear Jesus' physical voice at first. But, recognized, but failed to recognize that it was Jesus. In other words, Mary did not recognize by the sound of his voice in the ordinary sense of the word. But it is only by calling by her name that, Jesus, that Mary turned and what some of us may interpret a conversion. A conversion. From a metaphorical and spiritual perspective, this turning is not a physical action only, but also a conversion on the part of Mary Magdalene. Mary, the pre-Easter disciples, has to turn away from the things that lie behind. Mary insists that the absence of Jesus' body constitutes the absence of the living person of Jesus, but this is not to be so. So Mary has to turn away from this perception of this physical presence of Jesus has to be 
present in what this bodily person. Mary must turn back from her lament of who have taken my Lord. Mary must turn back, turn away from the angels. Why? Because she's already facing Jesus and speaking with him, this Jesus who is resurrected in her, in her presence. She now turns towards the glorified Jesus, the only one true teacher, he called Raboni. This reminds us that when we all die, you know, Easter, we talk about dying, and, but when we will be raised after our death and be in the midst of God and in the midst of Jesus, Jesus will call my name, not call me Reverend Dr. Tan Yat Hui. Or never call someone Mr. Mr. Who or President. All of us will be called by our name. Isn't that very nice? No. I'll be called Yat Hui, you'll be called Kenneth, you'll be called Michael, you know. And that's what it means when Jesus says, My shepherd, uh, the shepherd will call his sheep by name, and we will follow him. And so here we are in the second movement of the Mary Magdalene's Easter Symphony. What about us? At this Easter time, Jesus invites us to face him as he is truly risen and standing before us. What is our response? If we think that this is the end of the symphony, as I say, a symphony has four movements. The conductor moves us to the third movement. The third movement of Mary's Magdalene symphony, I call it announcing. Announcing. I would imagine that this movement is full and boisterous and resounding with the trumpets, with the horns, with the violins playing robustly. <coughs> Mary was ready to grab hold or hold on to Jesus upon hearing his voice. It is a natural reaction because of the joy that she experienced. Very natural. But Jesus' response to Mary was, do not hold me. And this phrase creates a lot of problems for interpretation and translation. Yeah. Does she try to touch Jesus, to hold him, or approach him? Or has Mary already touched Jesus? What? There's so many interpretation because of this verse. Do not hold me. According to the Greek translation, I teach Greek in, in the seminary, and so occupational hazard is that I will mention a little bit of this Greek problem that we have. According to the Greek, the meaning is that do not continue to touch me. Me or Mary already touched Jesus. But Jesus' emphasis was not about touching. The emphasis was me. The point of the word is me rather than the word touch. Do not touch me, but go to my brothers and sisters and announce that I'm going to my father, to your father, and so forth. What Jesus was forbidding is not so much as I say the touching itself, but Mary's selection of the object to touch. That is to touch Jesus who stands before her. What is Mary trying to do is to touch Jesus, to continue to hold on to Jesus as if this Jesus is res resuscitated. But Jesus wants to tell her this sort of relationship with Jesus is over. Standing before her is the glorified Lord, the one who is resurrected and glorified. And so 
Jesus commissions Mary to announce to the disciples that Jesus' work on earth is done. And its fruits is available now to the disciples. To the community, go to my brothers and to say to them, I am ascending to my father, to your father, to my God, and to your God. And this message was not only an affirmation of what Jesus has finished, his work on earth, but that there is a new life that is available to all who trust him. The presence of Jesus now resides with the community with the announcement of Mary to the disciples that the presence of God is with them now. The work of Jesus is completed by his glorification, but those who believe in him have become children of God as he promised. Imagine what wonderful announcement and commission that Mary had concerning the word from the glorified Jesus. And so let's imagine the conductor of the orchestra did a short overture summarizing the three movements from the depths of spiritual darkness and sorrow of the first movement it moves to the turning away from darkness to the new life offered by the glorified Christ who is now with God, the Father, who is also present in the community. It moves from the second movement to the third movement of a joyful one in which Mary Magdalene is to announce that which has been revealed to her. Mary was to announce the message. Three movements, beautiful that transform a symphony of despair to a symphony of hope. And at the end of the performance, there is always a response from the audience. It will be a response, encore, 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 more and more. And so we will presume that Mary's Magdalene Easter Symphony would ask for some response. And so perhaps each member of the audience will respond differently. Some will respond to the first movement, some will respond to the second movement, or some will respond to the whole three movements. Before the beginning of the first movement, as I said, there was a small overture of Mary telling Peter that the stone has been moved for he jumped into the conclusion that the body of Jesus is no longer in the tomb. And so we move on to the fourth and the final movement. We come to Peter and his disciples and Mary. As I say, the fourth movement is an invitation. As I, I say, the fourth movement is an invitation. If an invitation to respond. We have Peter and the disciples whom Jesus loved ran towards the tomb. But the disciples whom Jesus loved did not enter the tomb first, but he waited for Peter. We guess that the disciple whom Jesus loved was much younger, so was more faster runner than Peter. But also in terms that he respected Peter as being the senior member of the twelve. So he let Peter get in. Peter did indeed discover the empty body, but we never know Peter believed or did not believe because the text did not say that he believed, but we know one thing, that the disciples whom Jesus saw, loved, saw and believed. Just that. So the fourth movement of this Mary Magdalene symphony bring us back to the very beginning of John chapter 20. In the response of the disciples whom Jesus loved, he saw and believed. Perhaps the disciples whom Jesus loved remember the words that Jesus spoke on the last day 
the last, their last meal together, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. The empty body in the tomb is the assurance of Jesus' words that indeed he has overcome the world. And so the response of the disciples whom Jesus loved is an active response that Jesus indeed has risen and responds to do whatever Jesus will will him to do and likewise for Mary. Mary went back to tell the disciples all the things that Jesus had said to her. The fourth movement is what we call a fine, the finale of boisterous as an invitation to believe for what has happened after the three movements. Perhaps at the end of all the Easter, Mary Easter Symphony, we all will stand and sing the rousing hallelujah chorus of Handel's Messiah. Hallelujah, 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 King of kings, Lord of lords. Of course, this is Mary Easter Symphony. And that might be our symphony and standing up and sing, indeed, Jesus Christ is risen. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us pray. Dear God, the resurrection of your Son has given us new life and renewed hope. Help us to live as new people in pursuit of the Christian ideal. Grant us wisdom to know what we must do the will to want to do it, the courage to take it, the perseverance to continue to do it, and the strength to complete it. For the sake of Christ, we ask all this our prayer. Amen.